My name is Noctra, and I'm a math professor at UT Austin. Uh, when I was young, I would say maybe I'm in the top 10%, but not, you know, beyond that. Um, mathematics was interesting to me. Uh, it was natural, but I tend to make a lot of calculation mistakes. Uh, but to me, most of all, it was the way to socialize. I had a lot, was surrounded by friends who loved mathematics and we would exchange puzzles and things like that. And I love like the math circle structure that I grew up in Vietnam with. I was 16 and I got admitted to university and mathematics was the cheapest degree. And also it felt like a very um, sure path to uh, go to the US. I wanted to go, go to the US like at 14 or 15. I knew I wanted to go. I, I grew up partly in Australia and uh, and with other physical sciences, I really like like biology, chemistry, physics, software engineering. I consider all those, but I always felt there was like an experimental component to them that I could not control. But with mathematics, you know, the theorem is there to be discovered. And so I felt like, you know, if I just do well on those, then I can kind of be on a shorter path to, to, be, to, to do a PhD in the US. This question is always very hard for me because I do many different things. I started out doing statistics, but then I graded, gravitated towards probability, then it became combinatorics, and then it just sort of generally applied math. So uh, people would probably know my work depending on which area they're in. So like people in say algebraic geometry would tell them to say that I do some kind of tropical combinatorics. Um, people in economics would think I do auction theory. Um, uh, in neuroscience, I do some sort of theoretical neuroscience. Uh, then in statistics, then it's just like a melangerie of, of stuff. I also participated and came second in a, a data science competition. And that was like, uh, about random box on graphs, basically. Probably the main one is the imposter syndrome. So I like it's, I actually don't quite know how it developed, um, but it definitely appeared like uh, roughly like during grad school. So before grad school, I was, let's just say, extremely confident, right? I applied for uh, well, you know, you apply for grad school in the U.S. and you have to take the GRE. And the GRE was expensive for me at the time. I had to take it in Australia, it was a lot of money, and it allows you to send the results to five schools for free. So I put down five schools, MIT, Harvard, Berkeley, Stanford, and my backup was UC Davis. And I was confident, very confident, I would get in one of these five. I had zero backup plan. Right, this was my life dream to go to the PhD in the U.S. And those are basically all the school I know and uh, I knew at the time. And uh, yeah, so I I didn't have a confident problem coming in. Um, in grad school, um, it wasn't like you know some people I some of my peers they kind of develop uh, honestly like imposter syndrome after being surrounded by peers who are very good. I actually didn't have that problem because. When I was small, I was surrounded by peers who are better than me. So I knew that, you know, there's a variety of mathematicians out there. They're very talented. Not all of them go and do mathematics. Uh, so that was fine. I think the part was I helped myself to a very high standards. So I was, I always thought that if you solve a problem, but if the theorem that you use, the tool that you use was not complicated, it wasn't fancy, you know, you learned it took like a few months, anybody could have done this. And it always felt like that throughout my PhD, even though thinking back, like I saw problems, uh, you know, relatively quickly had many different independent publications, um, but it was, it always felt like I was coming up short of the kind of mathematics that I see in textbooks, the kind of theorem that are worth being called a theorem in textbook. So this continued on for a very, very long time, continued throughout my um, throughout my assistant professor time, throughout the postdoc time, even though there would be people telling me externally that I'm doing well, that I got, you know, I was very lucky to have choices when I caught when it comes to like getting a faculty position. Um, I got multiple offers, that kind of thing. It still felt, you know, um, 
something about my work is not difficult enough, right? Um, and part of it could just be boredom. Like there was a rush when you solve the problem after like persistently, you know, build out all the little lemmas and then you can kind of see the end. But if, until then, you still have to like do a lot of work until you get there. And then once you got there, you're like, ah, that was it. You know, that was like, it's so trivial looking back. Like, why didn't I solve this earlier? I, I was, that was something that I struggled with. One was I was giving my uh, my qual exam, which is an R exam at Berkeley. And it was about like uh, mathematics of ranking, da, da, da. I already got two papers by the time I got to the qual. And one professor in the audience, Jim Pittman, he said, at the end of it, he said, oh, you know, your work on ranking reminded me of my previous work on size by permutation. And I came into his office, he took out a drawer, very dusty handwritten notes uh, about size bias permutation. So I, you know, worked with him on that. And that whole paper, there's a picture at the end that was basically about a scatter of points. So the, the problem is quite simple. You have pairs X comma Y, uh, and let's say you order the X in increasing order, right? Then the Y get a random permutation. And you wanna know like statistics of this random permutation, et cetera. So, one way to visualize this is you have you visualize x comma y as a scatter on like the 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 plane and um yeah and then you kind of zoom into like the order statistics which are like the um when you rank the x then they become like the smallest x and the second smallest x and so on and if you kind of really zoom in then after a transformation they just look like uniforms the distance between minimum order statistics are like uniforms right and then but then the y gets some induced distribution so that's the scatter point like this picture it really stuck with me so then you know during my postdoc i look at say um the zeros of random tropical polynomials and then again like the same picture of scatter points came out and we were able to make the connections between the two and that came out as like actually really nice math it comes out to become like um simple like of questions people study since the late 1800s is if you throw down four random points in a square um, and you take the convex hole, right? Either you get a triangle, right? If you have four points, one point land in the interior, you get a triangle, or you get like a quadrilateral. Okay. Now, what's the probability of you getting a triangle? Okay. So that was, um, you know, people had methods for that to compute that question. It was known as the Sylvester problem. And then later on, people said, well, what if I threw an n points in d dimension? Right, take the convex hull, how many vertices do I have, et cetera. This turns out to have very interesting connections with like size bias permutations, with like sampling, and with uh, zeros of tropical polynomials. Right, so it was like a very nice unexpected connection. And then later on, uh, two or three years later, you know, by at the time I was a faculty at, at UT Austin, I was at um, um, I was talking to a group theorist in Manchester. We were meeting in uh, uh, Stockholm and they were mentioning some problem about, I don't know, multiplying groups together. They have this long string of identities and you can cancel things and that. And again, like it turns out there's a geometry underneath it. And again, it's like this scatter of points and you were taking convex hole. And so with that, then I wrote up like a short algorithm and then we were able to answer like an open conjecture in this area. I still know nothing about group theory, but like the, the picture really stuck in my mind. So yeah, that was like a, a series of work that was always like unexpected. And I kept on seeing this scatter of points and this idea being reused in many area. My early support person was Jackie Ramich. She was a professor in University of Newcastle, which is uh, where I went for undergrad. Uh, but she reached out to me when I was in high school and uh, and she worked out a deal between University of Newcastle and my local high school. They would my high school would pay for me to take a taxi to go to the university to take first year calculus classes. And not only that, she took her time to like, you know, take me home and then on the side, like, do random things on like uh, group theory with me. Now I didn't end up doing anything on group theory, uh, but yeah, I, I liked her analogy of like slicing bread and cosets, uh, but she was very instrumental in um, just, just telling me that 
a career in mathematics is possible. Um, that, you know, I can kind of look at her and she's like, a, you know, a female mathematician with children, have time for her kids, have time for, you know, random high schooler and have time for mathematics. And I think that was that was really wonderful. So first of all, thanks for asking this. I'm not sure if I have a lot of wisdom to offer. Um, I would say that I like to look at what really good mathematicians do, like what is it that they do differently? And what I've found is at some point, everyone is technically competent. So when you're young, you might felt like you have to dazzle with like technical skills, but I found that the very good mathematicians, they're very playful. There is a true enjoyment in what they're doing. And I think that is also true I think in our very youngest mathematicians, there is a true enjoyment in what they're doing. I still remember when I did Euclidean geometry, every theorem that I proved, I felt like it was mine. I didn't care that Euclid discovered this like many thousand years ago, but the fact that I proved it and I started building it up like a small tile of Lego, it was very rewarding. And I think there's probably a child like that in our heart, like everywhere. And it might just be like time for us to kind of like rediscover uh, that joy of doing mathematics. So yeah, so just make sure that when we do a problem, our I make sure that when I do a problem, I I have to remind myself that like, you know, the best problems are when it's purely driven by curiosity of yourself, like you do it because you want to know the answer. Uh, and because you want to play, I think good math is inseparable from just playing. And yeah, I think that that's my that's my words.